Welcome to the fifth and final lecture on war and storytelling in Ukraine. And this is what everyone's been waiting for. This is what the war movies and everything that we think of war is contained in, in this lesson. But I hope that you remember, and, and we'll do a quick review, why the first six principles are so important. Story is the essence of war. War, unfortunately, is a story that has turned violent. It is a battle of stories. It's a battle of narratives that can't be diplomatically worked out. And this, this happens in all fields of, of human life. People, unfortunately, get into physical altercations on, on an individual level, all the way up to global full-scale wars it, it all starts with a disagreement about something. It all starts with a different vision of the way things should be and typically starts with talking, which turns into yelling, which might turn into pushing and then fighting on the individual level. This is the same thing that happens in war. And wars start because people fundamentally believe that their vision for how the world should be is worth fighting for. And then that leads to the battle for intelligence, information, which we talked about in the first lesson, leads to the battle for in intelligence, which was the last lecture. And finally, intelligence drives everything in terms of operations, or should. And sometimes if it doesn't, if you don't have good intelligence or you don't understand intelligence, you're going to attack in the wrong place. You're going to defend something that doesn't need to be defended. You're going to do raids in the wrong place and you're going to lose the war. So ultimately, all those things lead to operations. But you cannot, and this is why this is so important, you cannot win a war with just intelligence. You cannot win a war without people who are willing to go put their feet on the ground and walk into dangerous situations. And that is the essence of operations in the last lesson that we're going to talk about. And of course, reconnaissance surveillance, human intelligence is also dangerous. And it takes incredibly brave people to go collect intelligence. But there's a reason why intelligence is, is conducted by elite forces, elite national agencies, elite special operations forces, elite GUR intelligence uh, units always get the best people because great intelligence takes individual Individuals who are willing to risk everything in very dangerous missions, human intelligence, spying, surveillance, reconnaissance, to gather the intelligence, which leads to operations and successful offensives, successful defensives, operations, successful raids. So that's what we're going to talk about in this last lesson. So this is the Battle of Stalingrad in 1943, some Soviet soldiers uh, entering uh, clearing the city. And the reason why I start with a story on Stalingrad is it has everything in one place that, that encapsulates what's important in operations. There are three major types of operations in the military uh, sphere. And th these three operations are as follows. First of all, offensive. At the end of the day, offensive is the most important because you need to be able to conduct offensive operations to ultimately win a war uh, in terms of conquering territory, reconquering territory. It's the hardest thing to get right. It is the hardest thing to get right. And before Ukraine successfully conducted an offensive operation in Izium and now in, in Kherson, a lot of people were wondering if Ukraine had what it took to win a war. And in Stalingrad, this was an offensive operation for the German army. It was the last great offensive, strategic offensive operation of the war for the German army. And they got 90% of the city of Stalingrad. They got all the way up to the river. And then the Soviet forces launched their own, after a successful defensive stand, defensive operation, they launched their own counteroffensive. So this heroic defense of Stalingrad, even though they lost 90% of the city, led to a successful offensive operation of the Soviet Union. And, and since Stalingrad, 
since the, this battle ended in, in January of 1943, the Soviet Union became uh, or found itself and put, it, put itself on the strategic offensive. And they never, after that point, there were many, many successful German offensives since Stalingrad, but the overall trajectory of the war was always offensive strategically for the Soviet Union and Germany moved into the strategic defensive um, for the war. Again, all kinds of offensives back and forth, but the tide had gone out and in Stalingrad it, it, it started to go in the other direction. So offensive and defensive, uh, critical, you know, binary uh, op polar opposites in terms of the amount of forces that you need, how to successfully conduct one versus the other, but they work together. Uh, an offensive stops and then you need to go into the defensive and defensive operations set up uh, the, the ability to go back onto the offensive. And, and then finally raids. And raids are not designed to hold territory, but they're designed to destroy critical resources on the battlefield, whether that's at the strategic level, the operational level, uh, the tactical level. Raids are, are designed to shape to set the conditions for, to allow offensive and defensive operations to be successful. And, and they can be incredibly important as we're gonna talk about in this lesson. So this is the German army marching through the outskirts of Kiev in 1941. And this is probably the biggest offensive operation in, in the history of modern warfare and, and probably warfare of all time in terms of um, the scale at the beginning, 3 million plus uh, German soldiers. Up until this point, there'd never been a larger uh, mass of, of soldiers launched uh, against an enemy formation. The Soviets, obviously, at the end of World War II, ended up dwarfing those numbers in their counteroffensives. But it was the largest uh, operation, offensive operation, up until that point in history. And it was a huge success at the beginning because the German military had the intelligence advantage and Stalin gave them this advantage. We talked about that in the last lesson and it put Germany on a strategically offensive path. It was an assumption in the German military that this was gonna take six to 12 weeks maximum. The war would be over before the, the weather turned bad and it ended up being a huge miscalculation but for the next two years, or about 18 months, Germany was on the strategic offensive against, uh, the, Ger uh, against the, the Russian army. And one of the things to understand about offensive operations is what it does, what it does to you as, as a country. It puts you um, in an incredibly stressful position in terms of replacing uh, parts, replacing um, vehicles that, that break down the German military. One of the reasons why this offensive operation ultimately failed was they never ramped up production uh, to have replacement tanks and replacement parts and enough ammunition. They ran out of ammunition, sounds familiar, uh, in the current war, uh, because offensive operations inherently are hugely unpredictable and consume massive amounts of people, equipment, and ammunition. And going into the offensive, going onto an offensive operation, is incredibly, um, it's, it's a huge operation. And, and I saw this in Iraq in 2003 when the United States Army also did a huge offensive operation to invade that country. It took them a long time to prepare for it, build up the supplies, uh, build up everything, the, the will of the people uh, to, go, to go in there. And the German military uh, set itself on a path of the strategic offensive in 1941 when they invaded Soviet Union. And again, the United States Army did the same thing when they invaded Iraq in 2003. And after that, the United States Army went on to the strategic defensive where they were securing a country, meaning they had to defend everywhere. They had to try and secure the local population. And what happened, was they started to lose ground in a lot of places. 
And this is actually a photo from t the Battle of Talafar, which was a town in northwestern Iraq in 2005, which had basically been uh, taken out of U.S. and Iraqi army control and was controlled by uh, insurgent forces. And, and this was an area where when we first got there in 2005, you couldn't go into the town without being shot at um, by the local population or elements inside the local population that were hostile to us being there. So this is a huge offensive operation, which I saw in, the, in September of 2005, where about 5,000 U.S. Army soldiers and about 10 to 15,000 Iraqi Army soldiers ended up going in and taking back control of this town of a couple hundred thousand people in north, northwestern Iraq. And again, it was a huge event. It, it took a huge amount of preparation, a huge amount of marshalling of resources, uh, coordination from all kinds of different units, U.S. Special Operations Unit, Rangers, uh, a battalion of airborne soldiers came in. We had uh, aviation assets from everywhere. And I remember sitting in this ancient Ottoman castle in the middle of this city where a huge part of the city right next to us, the ancient Sarai district where armored vehicles couldn't go, was hostile to us. And watching Navy SEALs running around this ancient castle, observing shooting down on targets in there. Um, and it was, it, was an, it was an incredible experience just to remember an offensive operation kicking off and, and what that meant in terms of the danger, the lives that were eventually uh, taken on both sides in that operation. And it was a huge, it's the most difficult thing you're ever going to do in war is to see, be part of this, this massive coordinated movement. The Russian army was doing something incredibly difficult on February 24th of 2022 when they first arrived. And the Russian military's plan, the entire plan of the offensive hinged on one thing going really, really well. And that was the seizure of the Gostomel airport. And when the Russian military came in and tried to seize that, they actually successfully landed several, do or uh, over, I think, uh, two dozen helicopters on the airfield with a couple hundred VDV paratroopers. And their plan was to land by the end of that day, several thousand Russian soldiers and armored vehicles on uh, transport, uh, IL-76 uh, transport planes in order to just drive straight into central Kiev and tell Zelensky, hey, you're no longer president, or hopefully he runs away, or, or they capture, they kill him. And that was the plan, and that was the foundation of the Russian offensive, was this air bridge straight into the center of Kiev, and all the other forces that were coming in from Belarus, from northeastern Ukraine, through Sumy, through the Cherniev region, through Kharkiv, were just designed to come in and reinforce that main effort. And what the Russian military got wrong was the intelligence. They did not believe that Ukraine would fight back effectively. Ukraine, on the other hand, had the intelligence from the Americans that said, hey, guys, listen to us, the war is gonna start. And when it does start, Gostomel Airport is critical to the Russian plan. So when that airfield was taken in the first couple hours of the war, Ukraine threw everything they had at that airfield to make sure that they took it back in the first day of the war. They, they sent out uh, the, the National Guard unit that was there got overrun in a couple of hours, but they sent out the 72nd Brigade. They sent out another reserve armored brigade they sent out a special operations unit to all counterattack that area. The Georgian Legion also sent people out there. I was talking to some people I know who knew Americans that were training Ukrainians before the war to get ready for the war. They went out there and got into this fight. And by the end of the day, the Russian paratroopers had been chased off of the airfield. And the Russian, uh, the Russian forces couldn't land on schedule because by that evening, they were supposed to be right in the center of Kiev. The morning, they were supposed to have taken it, but they got, they got pushed off of the airfield. But Russian armored vehicles that evening, they come in, and they're able to come in with the paratroopers and, and fight back and come in and try and retake the airfield, and they did. But the Ukrainian military, in the, term, in, in the, in the counterattack, instead of 
letting the airfield be used for what they knew was going to happen, which was flying in thousands and thousands of Russian uh, reinforcements, they destroyed the airfield, the, the runway, with massive artillery bombardment. And if that airfield would have been seized, because the, the Ukrainian air defenses at that point were running for their lives, so they weren't able to shoot anything down, and if Russia would have landed several thousand troops and armored vehicles to go along with it, they would have made it to central Kiev. Because Kiev was undefended, basically, at that point. And the people I've spoken to are fighting out in Irpin. If it wasn't for volunteers who rose up after the shock of the first day, who got up and got out there, that blocked the approaches to Kiev on the 26th, 27th of February, when massive Russian armor columns started to come in from Belarus, Kiev was basically undefended that first day of the war. So it was a hugely audacious plan that didn't succeed and because it didn't succeed, we think that it was inevitable that Russia would have not succeeded in getting Zelensky to, to give up, flee, or get killed or captured by the end of that first day. But imagine if it would have gone differently. So offensive operations never go according to plan. They're never as easy. They're never without friction, without uh, you know, chaos. And the Russians fell victim to their own beliefs about what their plan was and how successful it was going to be. And, and thankfully, the Ukrainians listened to that critical piece of intelligence. And they're able to win or not allow the Russians to use Gustavl Airfield to accomplish their, their daring plan on day one of the invasion. So offensive operations, Russia strategically went on the offensive at that point, and everything changed for their country in terms of the cost of man, material, ammunition, the cost of their economy, it completely changed the entire nature of Russia's relationship with the world. Look at the cost of that invasion. Again, the cost of the German invasion of the Soviet Union ultimately ended up costing Hitler Europe, which he'd basically conquered all of Western Europe or subdued Western Europe. And if he wouldn't have fought the Soviet Union, who knows what, what would have happened. So once a war starts, Russia at the beginning was on the strategic offensive. And this is a scene of a Ukrainian soldier entering Kherson. And Kherson was the first counteroffensive of the Ukrainian military, the first time that Ukraine actually started going on the offensive strategically. But Kherson was a operation. It was an operation inside of a strategic shift where Russia culminated late summer across the battlefield, in the Donbass, in Kherson, in the, in the entire, entirety of Ukraine, Russia no longer had the ability, because of attrition, because of casualties, because of equipment, because of sanctions, because of many things, to maintain the strategic offensive. So Kherson was the first operation, but it, it signified the shift from Ukraine to the strategic offensive, and Russia to the strategic defensive. That's when Putin said, hey, I'm ready to start negotiating. I'm ready to annex these territories, they're mine, because he knew that we're not going to get any farther. We're not going to be able to annex eight oblasts. We're going to be able to claim partially four of them. And Kherson was a hugely important strategic move, but it was an operation. It was an operation on part of the line. And Ukraine telegraphed very clearly that they wanted to go after Kherson, and it was a very tough fight the whole time. You had canals, you had very tough terrain for their forces to maneuver over, and it took from September all the way until early November for them to retake this, this territory. But we talked about in the last lesson, one of the things that made Kherson not easy, for sure, there were a lot of casualties, it was a very difficult fight, but one of the things that made it a lot less bloody than it could have been, especially if the Russians would have chosen to fight, was the intelligence. The human intelligence that allowed for the precision, timely targeting with HIMARS and other strategic assets of Russian logistics. Because operations ultimately are coordinated by headquarters that supply armies, that command and control armies, that tell them what to do, that give them the intelligence. And when you degrade logistics, intelligence, command and control, 
what you end up with is soldiers on the battlefield who have no idea why they're there and if the next supply is going to get to them, which typically they weren't by the end of the campaign, and they start to lose combat effectiveness. So operationally, Kherson was a huge success in this idea of attrition warfare, corroding the Russian military, wearing them down, constantly hitting them with different types of artillery, with HIMARS, with airstrikes and other things, destroying their air defense capabilities, and it succeeded. Now compare that to the Izium Offensive. The Izium Offensive, the Kharkiv Offensive, before, before Kherson successfully concluded, was a very different operation. It was a lightning advance in an area where the Russians had basically pulled out or left very small defenses uh, along the line. That's a very different operation in terms of shock, in terms of maneuver, in terms of getting the Russians to run away. Some of them got captured, many of them ran away, some of them got killed. It was a very different tempo, but both of them were operations at the operational level. Several thousand, tens of thousands of troops involved on both sides. And these operational maneuvers create strategic impact. In Kherson, you ended up having a lot of soldiers on both sides that no longer needed to be there because the river forms a natural boundary between all of them. So a lot of forces are being redeployed to other parts of the battlefield. So strategic offensive is when Overall, that the momentum is with you in terms of material, in terms of global support, in terms of manpower, where you, on most places, are advancing. That's where Ukraine moved to at the beginning of the Kherson Offensive. And you see these operations, Izium, Kharkiv, now Kherson. What's next? You're going to see this cascading series of offensive operations from Ukraine now that they're on the strategic offensive. But it doesn't mean that Russia can't also have offensive operations, operational level offensive, like, like they're trying to do in Bakhmut and some other area. They may, they may invade through Belarus again, create another operation that forces Ukraine to divert a lot of soldiers away from where they want to be attacking. And then finally, the tactical offensive. This is, this is a scene from Bakhmut. I was just meeting with a, a soldier who, who works, who fights as part of the G, GUR, Ukrainian intelligence unit. He's part of uh, some of their special forces sniper teams. And he was telling me exactly what's going on in the ground in Bakhmut. And Russia will launch these just endless waves of tactical offensives. 30, 40 people will come in and attack a certain part, a certain hill, a certain part of the village. They might take over a house. But as soon as one of them gets hit with a sniper or you take out a certain key leader in that group, this offensive fails. And you hear about all of this massive carnage going on at Bakhmut. It's just a bunch of uncoordinated tactical offensives. A lot of just waves of people who are getting off a bus and they're saying, okay, your convicts, your conscripts, let's put you guys together. Let's put someone in charge of you who probably knows what they're doing, a senior experienced person, and, and let's put you out there. Go, go make an attack on this area. And tactical offensives, tactical assaults are happening all over the, tre all over the trenches of the Donbass on, e on both sides. Ukrainians might take back a village here to get a better position, to improve their lines, to protect themselves. A lot of people are fighting right now to get into the cities because no one wants to spend a winter out in the middle of nowhere, freezing cold. And that's what tactical offensives are. They're, they're within gun, gun sight, right? You're attacking to get a better position, to protect yourself, to move around, but to get an operational effect, a bunch of tactical offensives have to have, a, have an overall goal. And they need to be supplied. One of the reasons why the Russians can't turn any of these tactical assaults that they're making inside the Bakhmut area to an operational advantage, for example, encircling and capturing that town is because they don't have the logistics. They don't have the supplies. They don't have the command and control. They don't have the intelligence to put all of that together. And this takes a lot of work and coordination at the staff level. Operations are all about logistics. It's a bunch of people 
making tactical assaults that are coordinated, that have a goal, that is properly supplied, that has the proper intelligence, so you can achieve something more than just a tactical goal, a tactical objective, like taking this hill or this little street or this little village, you need to be able to move and move and continue to create a bunch of tactical wins that create an operational effect, like the Russians leaving Kherson, evacuating that area. The, the Izium Offensive, where an entire uh, several, you know, 10,000 plus square kilometers are liberated, which completely changes the strategic dynamic of the war, where Ukraine showed to the West, we can win. We can do offensive operations. We can liberate territory. The money that you're giving us, the support you're giving us is not a waste. So after offensive operations, you need to be able to go onto the defensive. And the Soviet Union, after Stalingrad, they were on the strategic offensive. And they moved the battle line back all the way from the Caucasus area or, or near the Caucasus. They started moving all the way back to the borders of Ukraine, but the Germans were still able to attack. They were still able to launch their own offensive operations. And the last great battle, tank battle of, of World War II, the biggest tank battle of all time, actually happened in Eastern Ukraine and into Russia on the Battle of Kursk. And again, this is where the Germans were trying to launch a major operation to encircle and destroy a huge amount of Soviet forces. Maybe the Germans' view was they'd go back onto the strategic offensive if they were successful here. But the Soviet army was able to successfully defend against this last great German offensive, which, which basically confirmed and sealed this strategic wave that the Soviet Union was riding all the way to Berlin. And Kursk was one of the last great defensive stands the Soviet Union had to make before they fully transitioned to just relentless strategic series of op offensive operations. And again, when you conquer a country, and this is what the American army went through in Iraq, after you launch a successful offensive, you always have to move on to the defensive. Even if there's no organized enemy resistance, securing and ruling a country is a huge defensive operation. It is a huge internal security task that you have to be able to do. And one of the things that Russia really underestimated when they invaded Ukraine was the scope of holding and pacifying the territory they were going to conquer. And that's why Ukraine didn't believe that how on earth could Russia do this with 190,000 soldiers when the United States Army couldn't subdue Iraq, which had half the population of Ukraine, with a couple hundred thousand soldiers, right? So to them, it just didn't make sense. But Russia, what was their assumption? Their intelligence was, we don't need 500,000 soldiers because we're going to have half of Ukraine on our side. Everyone to the, on the left bank of the Dnieper is going to be on our side. They, most of them speak Russian. We've got everyone on the SBU on our payroll. We've got all kinds of intelligence people inside Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine wants to be back on Russia's side. So the people are going to support us. We don't need all those troops. We need to just jump in there, shock them, change the regime, put Medvedchuk, a Ukrainian, in charge, maybe bring in uh, uh, Yanukovych too, and they'll be happy. That was their assumption. So you can see how intelligence drives all these massive blunders on the strategic level when Russia came in. They didn't have the forces they needed for this strategic offensive they're on. And in America, in the American army, when we went into Iraq, we had a similar problem. We actually had enough soldiers and we were able to get into Iraq and topple the entire regime in three weeks. But until we ramped our forces up to almost 200,000 people in a country half the size of Ukraine in terms of population, and at that point we had an Iraqi army and Iraqi police force of several hundred thousand each that was also working with us, we weren't able to secure the country. So, the defensive is not just fighting another army. 
but it's also securing the, the population. Because when you come in and you conquer an area, the police is going to be gone. The police is going to not be functional anymore. You might come in and think you can use it, but probably they're going to be part of the resistance against you. If they're good, patriotic people, the entire Iraqi army, <laughs> when we invaded Iraq, was disbanded a couple weeks later by the American authorities. And most of those people who are used to be in the Iraqi army, guess what? They became part of the resistance because they knew how to fight. They had no money, but they had a skill set, which was fighting. Same thing in Ukraine. When, when the Russian military came in, you put a bunch of people out of work. If they have any military experience, what do you think they're going to do with it? And of course, the story, whether people in Ukraine wanted to have Russian soldiers in uh, their country, obviously not, based on the resistance we're seeing, but there's still an economic component to it. There's still a skill set to it. All these former Ukrainian soldiers who'd been fighting for eight years on the Donbass who had military experience, they were a threat. And that's why Russia looked for, actively looked for those people. They came in, they had lists of people who they're looking for who had prior military experience from local human intelligence sources, Ukrainians who were traitors and became human, human intelligence sources and gave these lists to Russians. But that's the fight that you're in when you conquer a country. And that's why Russia has so many soldiers in Ukraine, but so many of them are not on the front lines because they're consumed by this rear area security. Now, Ukraine has the same thing. Like Ukraine still has a national police force that has to be securing the country, doing regular things that police does, emergency services. So out of the a million people that are in Ukrainian armed forces, maybe 200,000 of them are close to the front lines even. The rest of them are training. They're getting ready to go out there. There's, there's this huge national police force. There's the border guards. There's all, all kinds of people that Ukraine needs to keep a society functioning, to make sure that there's not a lot of people running around Kiev giving targets to the Russians. A lot of people need to be running counterintelligence. It's, it cuts both ways. But Ukraine, uh, fortunately for them, has their, their main police force has generally stayed intact, generally stayed loyal, a lot less, um, a lot less loyal, I'm sure, than Putin wished, uh, or a lot more loyal, I'm sure, than Putin wished they would have been. Probably a lot of traitors still within the Ukrainian security services that need to be rooted out by the counterintelligence forces. But this internal security, keeping a society functioning, is critical. That's why Russians have been bringing in huge amounts of FSB officers, internal security forces, into the areas that they're conquering. So in, in May of 2022, you guys will probably remember, uh, Mariupol at the beginning of the war, by, by early March, was completely surrounded. And Ukraine was on the strategic defensive everywhere. And the, the soldiers that were surrounded in Mariupol were absolutely in a hopeless position. From, it was very clear from very early on that it was a hopeless position. And the Ukrainian military made a decision, the National Command made a decision to not only tell those soldiers to keep fighting, and, and they didn't need to be told to keep fighting, they were actually begging to be told to keep fighting in terms of the Azov Regiment, the Marines down in Mariupol, but they were supported in that decision. They were given emergency ammunition resupply flights with helicopters, which over 50% of these emergency uh, flights that, that went in were, were one-way trips, where either the, with, due to maintenance issues or them getting shot down, these pilots knew there was a good chance they weren't returning because that's how important it was to the Ukrainian National Command to spend hugely valuable resources of helicopters and pilots to resupply Mariupol. Why did they do that? Why did this garrison hold out until May of 2022? And the answer is look at these masses of Russian soldiers. 15, 20,000 Russian soldiers were tied up in surrounding and conquering the city of Mariupol. And why was, that, why was that so important for Ukraine to do? Because everywhere else around the front lines, in the Donbass especially, 
Ukraine was, was absolutely struggling for supplies, for artillery ammunition. The Ukrainian military was on the brink of collapse due to just, they ran out of ammunition, they ran out of artillery, they ran out of everything. So, so why did the Ukrainian garrison at Mariupol fight in this almost suicidal manner for so long in May, up until May? Why did they hold out for two months? And why did the Ukrainian government give them, in suicidal resupply missions, the ammunition to give them the hope to continue to hold out? And why, at the end of the day, did Zelensky order the garrison to surrender? It's because it was a strategic decision to tie down the vast majority of Russia's best forces to buy time. Because Ukraine, at that point, if Mariupol would have fallen quicker in March or even in April, the entire Ukrainian formations in the Donbass were, was out of ammunition and could have been surrounded, cut off, and destroyed. And the war would have been over. So this defensive, strategic defensive, and a, and a very calculated decision and tough decision by the Ukrainian armed forces, I believe will go down in history as one of the great defensive operations of all time because of the impact it had on the battlefield. It gave Ukraine time to convince the international community with the stories that are coming out of Mariupol, soldiers singing national songs, all of these stories that are coming out with Starlink from the garrison, the legend of this garrison built up international resolve and support. And what happened at the end of May, Western ammunition, Western artillery, miraculously gets donated to Ukraine, which no one ever thought before the war this would have happened. The Ukraine started getting NATO standard artillery and ammunition. And even then, remember President Zelensky at the end of May, he said the front line is an absolute hell and we're losing between one to 200 soldiers a day. It is absolutely a disaster and he wasn't lying. Ukraine was on the brink at that point. And the only reason they got to May and got through May when literally almost no ammunition and bodies are just up at the front plugging holes with little but, you know, what rifle ammunition they have, almost no artillery. The only reason Ukraine got through that was because of Mariupol. And that sacrifice, that strategic defensive sacrifice that they made. So this, this is gonna go down as one of the great and tragic and heroic all at the same time defensive operations. And for Ukraine, the story that comes out of this, this battle, just like in America, you have the Alamo in Texas where this heroic garrison goes down fighting. The story of this heroic resistance in the face of all odds, and then their capture and subsequent release, and some of the tragic circumstances of, of some of the soldiers who were killed in captivity, all of that is gonna create this legend, already has created a legend that will continue to grow on Ukrainian national identity. So you see the stories that come out of these things create, literally can create a nation and create a, a country uh, that has a completely different identity. The, the Mariupol garrison, the Azov style specifically, but the entire experience of Mariupol, which still has not has yet to be written and won't be written until the entire city and, and the surrounding environment has been liberated and all those people have been kidnapped, deported, forcibly displaced to Russia from Mariupol until they all come back or somehow reassemble somewhere and tell their story, this story is not, is not finished. It will never be finished. It will, it will always be the, the legends and the story around it will be being written. And this is June of 2022, a uh, famous photo of the evacuation of Ukrainian soldiers who'd been holding out in Severodonetsk in this period where Russia was, was on the brink of a huge breakthrough in the Donbass. In the north, from Izium and, and, and the, the Lugansk region, if Mariupol had not been holding out until May like they did, there would have been this huge armored movement from the south, and Russia would have been surrounding the, the most experienced, the main forces of the Ukrainian military at that point. And 
These soldiers who were at Severodonetsk were, and there's a lot of controversy of, over how long they should have been holding out in Severodonetsk, but, but it was an operational decision to block again. You have Mariupol in the south, you have Severodonetsk, and then Lysychansk after that in the north. It was a calculated decision to create, to bleed the Russian army in, in urban environment where Ukraine, with not a lot of ammunition, had some kind of advantage. And again, that, that battle took several weeks, took probably thousands of casualties on the Russian side and, and a huge cost on the Ukrainian side too, created this operational effect where this is the last major offensive operation, successful offensive operation of the Russian military. Huge cost. Again, I, I met some people who were in Bakhmut from the Foreign Legion who were sent in there to recapture the city. They did for a while or parts of the city and then they got driven out. And what did they do? At great cost, casualties, they bought time. And I remember asking uh, Andrei Zagorohodnyuk, the ex-defense minister of Ukraine at the time, what, what is going on? Why, why is Ukraine fighting this almost pointless battle for, for, for Severodonetsk? They, we knew we, they, they, that they couldn't hold it. He said, we're buying time. We're buying time. Now, was that the right decision? Should they have done it in Severodonetsk? Should they have moved back to Lysychansk? There's a lot of debate over that because Lysychansk might have been easier to hold. It was on the high ground, other side of the river. But that, that is an operational level defensive move that was a huge sacrifice and cost, but also bought time. Remember, the defensive is not how you win wars. But defensive is a place where you can extract enough cost from the enemy and set the conditions where you can move into the offensive. In Ukraine, in Mariupol, in Severodonetsk, the defense in the Donbass set the stage to get Russia to the point of a strategic exhaustion where they could move back on, the, they could move for the first time really, Ukraine, onto the offensive. If you would have told anyone before the war that Ukraine would not only still exist as a state in November of 2022 and be on the strategic offensive everywhere and had two very successful operational offensives reclaimed tens of thousands of square kilometers of territory in the north and the south of the country, I don't think a lot of people would have believed you. But that's, that's how war happens. That's why those critical first days of the war when Russia was on the offensive at Gostomo were so important. And finally, the tactical defensive. This is uh, actually a picture of Vauxhall Street in Bucha. And I actually met the, the couple uh, man and woman, now uh, both active service officers in the Ukrainian army that helped ambush this column here in Bucha that destroyed an entire Russian advanced unit on the 27th of February that was on its way to the heart of Kiev. And this defensive action where they called in artillery strikes and Bayraktar drones and ambushed with RPGs and, and all kinds of other things that created this basically blunted and stopped cold the Russian offensive into Kiev. And it didn't need to happen that way. In fact, if it weren't for volunteers in Irpin, Ukrainians who the Russians had no idea would be there because they weren't regular army soldiers, All, most of the main Ukrainian forces were at Gostomel fighting in that region, north of Irpin. If it wasn't for volunteers, for six days, at the beginning of the war, there was nothing but territorial defense and volunteer fighters and some small units of Ukrainian intelligence who were coordinating it all that, that basically stopped the Russian military cold. And she describes to me having three cell phones, all different carriers, so that whichever one was working at the time could send the information back to the Ukrainian military. And, and that's how that convoy was stopped just by volunteers calling in strikes, artillery, who had some military experience, and then some really crazy ones who go up and participate in the direct fire ambush themselves. So these small tactical moves, like destroying this column, made that area impassable for 
Russian vehicles for a long time. And this is basically as far as they got. Russians never got, well, they got into parts of Irpin, but not from this area. This, this area ended up being just about a couple kilometers farther is all, is all they got. Okay, last principle I'm gonna talk about, the, the ninth and the last one, but certainly has a huge impact on is the raid. And in World War II, there were a lot of famous raids. Probably the most famous one on the Allied side was Doolittle's raid after the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor, which Pearl Harbor was basically a, a Japanese raid too at a, at a big level. Where they came in, they, they weren't gonna conquer or hold that territory, but they destroyed the US Navy fleet, or most of the fleet. In fact, their, their carriers, the most important part of the fleet was actually not there, which probably changed the course of the war by not having their carriers destroyed. But the Japanese, that was, Pearl Harbor was one big massive raid that was designed to destroy a critical asset, the US Pacific fleet, um, and, and give it a huge advantage in the, in the beginning of the war. They couldn't conquer Hawaii, they didn't have the troops to do that, but they certainly had the troops to do the raid. And after that, in reaction to that raid, the U.S. did their own raid. They, they actually sent bombers from an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific, which no one thought could be done, and they bombed the Japanese capital of Tokyo uh, in something that's called Doolittle's Raid. And raids can be done by aircraft. They can be done by special operations forces like the rescue of Mussolini by, by some of Hitler's special operations forces. They can be done by airborne forces, like basically the, the, uh, the assault on, on Gostomel was not a raid because the, the Russians intended uh, to stay there, but other helicopter forces that come in and out for some high value target and leave, that's a raid. And ambush is basically a form of a raid where you're, you're destroying some forces by, by sitting in ambush. But, but raids are not designed to take and hold territory, but they're designed to kill and destroy critical high value targets at all levels, from strategic all the way down to the tactical level. And this is actually a raid that we, we were on in Iraq when I was there, and we were told about a high value target that was in our area. We ended up going up there and we got into a three hour firefight with, with him and some of the people he was with. And when we, we ended up killing him and, the, and uh, his, his uh, bodyguard, I remember seeing that night national television in Iraq was, was broadcasting the news because this guy was, was a huge uh, leader inside the, uh, the Iraqi resistance. And raids have a huge impact on the battlefield, like when Ukraine has killed generals in raids or, or strikes, whatever, whatever killed the Russian generals, that has a huge impact on the fighting effectiveness of the enemy forces. And, and that's why when you secure a territory, like Russia has secured parts of Ukraine and they're patrolling it, defensively, they're out there observing, they're, they're conducting reconnaissance patrols, they're observing, but when they know that they want to find someone who's collaborating as they see it with Ukraine or from the Ukrainian side, patriotically assisting Ukrainian resistance, they're going to do raids. They're going to go looking for someone. They're going to go into a house and try and arrest people. And that, that was basically the essence of what we did in Iraq. Instead of dropping artillery, which you do in high intensity conflict, when you're securing an area, you just go almost like a police police mission, you go in, you surround a place, you ask someone to come out, or you go in and, and you try and arrest them first. Or you, you might go in more aggressively and try and shoot them, depending on what the rules of engagement are and the threat level. Most of the work that we did in Iraq was raids. It was surveillance, patrols, reconnaissance, and then when you got information, uh, most of our operations to control the area was raids. And in Ukraine, Right now, there's raids going on on both sides of the lines. Russian Spetsnaz, I'm sure, are doing raids, which we don't hear about, but looking for and trying to destroy HIMARS, which they keep saying they do and never do. Uh, air patrols, which turn into raids. I mean, what are the, 
raids on infrastructure, these uh, attacks on electricity and infrastructure, those are strategic level raids. They are designed to accomplish a strategic effect, which is ruining the economy of Ukraine and ruining the will of the people to fight with, uh, with their impact. So strategic raids are things that have a huge strategic level impact on, on the war. And the classic example for this war was the Kerch Bridge bombing. 8 October changed probably the course of the war in, in a lot of ways because what two things happened from that. One, it cut off Crimea as a major resupply hub for the southern forces in Kherson. One month later, Kherson is liberated, right? And a huge part of that liberation was simply the lack of supplies that Russia was able to get into Crimea or through Crimea up into Kherson because that was their secure ground line of communication. And it was perfectly timed for the battle that was going on. So that had a strategic impact in terms of cutting off logistics. The, the second impact it had was it was a huge embarrassment to President Putin. Strategically, it shows that what he calls Russian territory, Crimea, is not safe. Just like the Saki Air Base was also um, less strategic of a raid. I'll go over that next. But it, but it had a strategic impact. And it also created a strategic escalation on Putin's part. Now, I'm not saying that the Crimean Bridge created uh, the campaign against Ukrainian infrastructure. That's unknowable. We don't know if Russia was planning that before it happened, but it certainly didn't help in terms of Russia's ferocity and, and their inhibitions around striking the Ukrainian population with, with the raids that started on 10 October. In terms of the strategic reaction, strategic raid triggers Maybe it didn't uh, directly trigger, but it certainly escalated Russia's strategic raids back at Ukraine in, in terms of the campaign against the civilian population. And the same thing happened in World War II. Strategic bombing runs of the United States Air Force targeting German cities and Japanese cities were, were designed to break the will of the population. And they didn't. They actually, when you look at the, um, you look at the, the data after the war, if anything, they em embittered uh, and prolonged the resistance of both the Japanese and the German people, except for, and this is the big reason why I think nuclear is still on the table as, as a concern and a threat for, for Russia, is after the atomic bombs were dropped that did seem to play a part in shocking the Japanese leadership into a strategic uh, capitulation. Now, an operational raid, a great example of an operational level raid is the Saki Air Base uh, strike in August. Now, it, it also is strategic in a lot of ways because, again, it had the same impact of showing that Crimea wasn't safe. It was a huge embarrassment uh, to the Russian army. But, but specifically, it was an operational impact in terms of half of the Russian fleet of jet aircraft that were supporting combat operations in, in the southern a battlefront were, were destroyed. And it also made that, that part of Crimea, a lot of aircraft were moved out. So it created a, a huge operational impact in terms of Russia's ability to do close air support from what it thought was a safe area for the Southern Front. So again, you can see how it, it paid, played a huge role in shaping the Kherson offensive. And then finally, uh, tactical raids. Now tactical raids, they're so numerous, they're happening every day all over the front. This is actually a before and after photo from Aero Rosidka, uh, the Aero, Aero Reconnaissance Volunteer Unit that is now uh, integrating itself across the battlefront in Ukraine. I've also met with these guys and, and spent some time with them, some of their pilots. And Aero Rosidka is really interesting because it's a nonprofit organization that at the beginning of the war uh, participated in the Battle of Kiev in terms of going out on dirt bikes and ambushing uh, a lot of Russian units on the way from Belarus, stopping entire 
Russian convoys because when you ambush someone at, at the exact choke point over a bridge or where people can't get off the road, uh, it creates huge operational impacts. But these tactical level strikes with drones where you destroy a critical logistics asset like a fueler, which blows up and destroys that part of the road, can create huge operational impacts, stop entire columns from getting to a battle. And the Aero Rosidka was, was famous for its, its operations in the Battle of Kiev, and now they're all over the front lines with drones that not only can do reconnaissance, but their drones, which they've been developing this technology for a while, are very good at dropping munitions, you know, anti-tank grenades, anti-personnel grenades, and these, these create the opportunity for you know, close air support for Ukrainian forces all over the front line. And, and it, it, it almost gives these smaller units their own little air force to do their own raids and conduct their own uh, tactical level raids. So it's, it's democratizing, it's dropping down to the lowest tactical level some of these strategic assets like air droppable munitions from uh, you know, helicopter missile strikes, which might be an operational raid. This, this is now coming down through drone technology uh, to the tactical level. And again, tactical raids can be army uh, forces that just go out and they might do an ambush against the enemy unit. They might be looking for a collaborator in their local town uh, that's, that's helping the Russians or Russians might be looking for uh, partisans that are helping the Ukrainian forces. So raids are all over the place and they happen at every level and a really good tactical commander uses them to get an advantage because if you take out the enemy fueler, the enemy command post, tanks that are supporting the enemy, that can create an advantage which can lead to offensive operations. It can lead to an, a successful offensive or help your defensive operations be much more successful. So that, that finishes our talk of the nine principles of war and also is the last part of our lecture series here um, to all of you here. And I, I just wanted to thank the students of Kiev Mahila uh, Academy, your journalism school, and um, the opportunity to teach you guys. It's been a privilege interacting with all of you, and I, I look forward uh, to seeing you all grow as storytellers for this war. And I just wanted to bring together all the points that we've made throughout this course. War is fundamentally a story. It's a story about your nation. It's a story about your cause. And people will die for stories. And I think Ukraine is proving to the world uh, that what happens when a country's united around a national story and, and willing to die for it. And that is despite all the divisions that Ukraine entered the war with that are still there, that people are putting aside right now to fight together and to defeat a common enemy and will emerge, unfortunately again after the war, if Ukraine and the people who are telling the stories from this war don't get it right. Ukraine's famous, and I've got a lot of good friends who, who know Ukrainian history really well, Ukraine's famous for fighting really, really well and then screwing it all up when they have the chance uh, during peacetime. And this is something that, that I think is is really important for Ukraine to understand now while the fighting's happening. And this is why we created the Borderlands Foundation and why we're creating this, this research center to take the stories from this war at every level, whether it's someone doing heroic reconnaissance or intelligence work, or someone who's doing you know, heroic offensive operations or defensive operations or raids, and take all of these stories and create something that, that is unifying. Because for me, as someone who is not from Ukraine, but married to someone from Ukraine, wants to live here and raise a Ukrainian family, um, I'm part of this, right? I wanna be part of this as a historian and, and someone who can, can help create this future we all wanna have in this country. And I, I consider myself uh, Ukrainian in my outlook and my desire, where I wanna live, where I choose to live, what I choose to do during this war, much more than anything else. And I've fought for another country. I've fought for the United States Army, and I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of that experience. But 
I'm also from the United Kingdom. My dad's English. I grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and I watched a war as I was a child, and I, I lived through it. It was just kind of normal. People, my friends all wonder, well, how can you go live in Ukraine? Because it's optional for me. And you get used to it. And, and you also believe that um, you know, there's something more important than complete safety or complete uh, comfort. And that's why it's such a privilege to work alongside all the people I've, I've worked with in the Borderlands Foundation and my friends uh, here that I'm making during the war that I don't think I'd ever make in any other circumstance. And what comes from war is the most intense uh, experiences you ever have in life, and that, that's what Ukrainians are experiencing at all levels of society, especially the ones that are on the front lines, but not just. And what also comes from war is great relationships that form the foundation for a much better story than, than Ukraine came into this war with. And that's really the goal of this foundation. So what I want to do here for, for all of you who are watching this video, and, and not just the journalism students that have to do this for the class, because that's your assignment. You have to go tell a story of a hero of Ukraine, someone who's fought or done something, whether that's civilian, volunteering, or on the front lines, and tell their story and, and, and give that to the world and, and contribute to this research center here in, at the Borderlands Foundation. But if you're watching this video and you're not part of my class, um, and I know there's a lot of you who are watching this who have just seen it online, I'd like to thank you for watching these videos. And I'd like to invite you to also join us. Uh, and there's many ways you can join the Borderlands Foundation. First, uh, this is actually a picture from uh, a, a round table that I held where it was a trip full of uh, analysts, uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian war analysts. This is Andrei Zagorohodnyuk there. Uh, also Ilya Ponomarenko of the Kiev Independent. Andre was the former Minister of Defense of Ukraine. And we were on a, a round table with Michael Kaufman, top Russian military analyst. And uh, also um, Franz uh, Stefan Getty also came in on that trip and Konrad Muzika. And they were all there and we facilitated that trip for them at the Borderlands Foundation. And it was a huge privilege to watch these experts, top of their field in the world, uh, at the Russian military analyst, uh, help Ukrainians um, understand what, what our perspective is, or and I say our, the Western perspective is outside of Ukraine, and also ask Ukrainians how they could help, because that's what everyone here is trying to do. So we're facilitating trips to Ukraine for people who want to get into Ukraine that have something to add of value. So if you're watching this and, and you'd like to get in touch about that, please do message us and we can see how we can help you if you want to come volunteer inside Ukraine or you've got something to add to the fight. We could certainly connect you with our, our network of people inside Ukraine, whether it's nonprofits or military units or however you want to help. So that's the first thing. Second thing is if you just like what we're doing and you want to help us create more of this content. I rely right now on volunteers who are, who are putting together these stories, but you can also donate to our team that is building these stories and makes these videos and, and help us make more videos. They're all Ukrainians who work for us and they need to get paid. The, the economy's gone way down here and uh, we wanna support them, the people who make these videos and put out this great content. Um, and finally, uh, it allows us to tell more stories of more heroes uh, that are going to form the memory of this war that unifies Ukraine, that creates a strong uh, national story that can not only inspire them to have a better future and, and, and build a better society after the war, but inspire the West with what's possible. So that's another way you can, you can support us. And then just spread the word. Tell people about this series that you just watched, share it with them and go look at the stories on our website and donate to those people, whether they're soldiers who are still fighting, who need support, or family members of those who are killed, or whoever you see on our website that you want to support individually, or just support the organization in general and our mission to keep telling more stories and help educate Ukrainians in the world about the history that is being built from this war at great cost. So thanks again, everyone, for joining, watching this series, and your attention. Look forward to those of you who are going to create stories. If you want to volunteer for the foundation, that's a final way. If you want to volunteer, you've got digital marketing expertise 
where you speak Ukrainian, obviously, and you can help us volunteer uh, by interviewing people, or you don't speak Ukrainian, but you want to also find out how you can volunteer and help, you can also reach out to us and, and we'll see if you're a good fit for our team of volunteers from around the world. We've got a great volunteer uh, entrepreneur on our team who, who is an expert at building and recruiting volunteer teams. Uh, so those are the three ways you can support what we're doing. Uh, help us help you help Ukraine. If you, if you want to come into Ukraine itself, we can organize that trip and help you with that. After the war, we're going to do tours of Ukraine. If you're watching this video after the war, it's, uh, we're going to show people after the war what happened here and, and, and organize trips around Ukraine to see the battlefields and see the country. And then if you want to support families that sacrificed everything for Ukraine, soldiers, uh, volunteers, heroic members of society in general, you can read their stories on our site. We've got them all over the site and donate to the ones that inspire you. Or you can just donate to our team in general and help us build and put out more of this content. And then finally, if you don't have money, but you have time and an expertise that can help spreading the word of the foundation, I got a great entrepreneurial volunteer uh, leader who can uh, help you find out where you can contribute. But whatever the, the case, thanks for supporting Borderlands. And it's been a pleasure teaching you about war and storytelling in Ukraine.